Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a challenge to talk to uh, cosmologists uh, with a small c and also uh, philosophers of cosmology. I'm going to warn you in advance that I'm showing you a tremendous amount of material that basically amplifies and, and uh, gives some details of what Joe Silk said uh, is the status of understanding structure and especially galaxies. So this is the ultra deep field. It's very beautiful, but you should understand that all the light you're seeing is coming from about half of 1% of what's actually there. The amount of stuff that is radiating is about half of 1%. And the part of that that we are made of, aside from the hydrogen, uh, is about a hundredth of a percent. That's all the heavy elements that are made by stars. So you can imagine that the entire universe is an ocean of dark energy, the bottom part of this pyramid, about 70% of the volume, with cold dark matter, another 25%, and invisible atoms, about 4%, and the visible stuff, about half of 1%. So dark matter ships on a dark energy ocean. We don't see the ships. We don't see the ocean. All we see are the beacons at the tops of the biggest mass of the biggest ships. Those are the galaxies. Now, this is a bizarre story, as uh, Ofer Lahav and others have emphasized. But we start from the Big Bang. We simulate the evolution of a representative part of the universe, according to the double dark theory, the theory that uh, says that it's mostly dark matter and dark energy. So I think we need a friendly name for that. And we see if the result matches what the observers see. The simulations on the large scale are fantastically successful. I keep personally being amazed. And I do them. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to give you just a summary of the key idea of cold dark matter. So this is uh, from uh, a paper, a conference proceeding, that I published with my collaborator, George Blumenthal, back in 1983. And this is basically an idea that Joe Silk explained. So basically, all the fluctuations on scales of 10 to the 6, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 12 solar masses, 10 to the 15, et cetera, come into the horizon at almost the same amplitude. If n sub s were exactly 1, that would be exactly the same amplitude. The best estimate is that it's 0.96, which is very close to 1. So they're all coming in at the same amplitude. So that means that. They come inside the horizon. This is the log of the amplitude of the fluctuations. And then they don't grow very much, only logarithmically, until the universe becomes matter dominated. This is the log of the scale factor. It's, by definition, 1 today. So log equals 0. And what you see is that there's this larger and larger gap once you exceed 10 to the 15 solar masses or so. So if you just read off the amplitude here, you get the cold dark matter spectrum. That's this. It's not white noise. It's not cut off the way a hot dark matter spectrum would be. It looks like this. Now, we predicted this back in 1984. I mean, in 83, we were publishing this. In 84, there was the cold dark matter paper, Sandy Faber, uh, George Blumenthal, Sandy Faber, Martin Rees, and me. Well, this is what it actually, what the data looks like. That's that same curve. On scales smaller than galaxies, the Lyman Alpha Forest, galaxies, clusters of galaxies, all the way out to the horizon, it's exactly what we predicted. The same theory, combination of inflation, telling us the way the fluctuations enter the horizon, plus growth of structure, cold dark matter, predicted a curve that had these wiggles. You can adjust the curve slightly by getting the parameters exactly right. This is the f famous six parameters. And it also is a very nice explanation of all the rest of the cosmic microwave background data. So the way individual galaxies form, however, is only partly understood because it depends on the interactions of ordinary atomic matter, as well as dark matter and dark energy, to form stars and black holes. So as Joe Silk explained, uh, this is a difficult problem. And although cold dark matter is basically pure thought, here we needed help from observations. So astronomical observations are snapshots. 
we see galaxies as the light left them millions or billions of years ago. But we theorists can make movies, either metaphorical or real, and I'll show you some real ones. And uh, the idea is to make a coherent physical theory that matches the observations. First, I'll talk about large-scale simulations. Then I'll talk about hydrodynamic galaxy simulations. So the drunk sitting on the stoop, he says, quarks, neutrinos, mesons, all those damn particles you can't see. But now I can see them. So you too will see the dark matter, because in the simulations, we can let the dark matter be light. So everything you're going to see that's light in the next few uh, videos is dark matter. So this is a visualization of the evolution of the nearby part of the universe. Could you turn down? Yeah, that's good. So what's happening is that these filaments form. First sheets form, then the filaments form. The dark matter is basically beads on the string, but the filaments get thicker as the material drains toward the massive cluster size halos. And now the simulation has ended, and we're just flying through and admiring the scenery. So I'll cut that one off. So here's another visualization. We can now do these on the fly. And uh, that showed the, these filaments very clearly. So this is the size of a galaxy like the Milky Way, about 100,000 light years across with a visible galaxy. And that's the dark matter halo. This is one of the beautiful simulations by Volker Springle and collaborators. And notice all the substructure. It's an interesting question whether that substructure really exists. There's a lot more of it than we see in the form of any visible galaxies. There is evidence, however, which I'm not going to have time to explain, that there really is a lot of substructure on the scale of galaxies. How does this fit into the large scale structure? More or less like this. So this is the Bolshoi simulation by Anatoly Klippin and me. Uh, and we've run the simulation first with the WMAP parameters. We re-ran it with the Planck parameters. And we've made these results very widely available to the public. And uh, hundreds of papers are now being based on this. It's much more accurate than the Millennium simulations. Let's look at a very small region, a region that's only a thousandth the size of the simulation. So you see the structure of filaments. Where the filaments cross, there are the big halos of things that would host clusters of galaxies, with tens of big galaxies and thousands of small ones. So how did that big halo form, just the th this halo here? We save about 200 time steps to the big simulations. That means every particle, about 10 billion particles, and then we follow the entire history of the merging of every single object at every time step. This is what it looks like. Every one of these objects is going to be hosting a galaxy that will end up in the big cluster. Notice that the halos are elongated, especially the big ones. Many people have studied that. We, we understand that the larger the halos, the more massive they are, the more elongated they are. And that's true of uh, the uh, groups and clusters of galaxies we see in the real universe. Notice also that the flow is in along that line, that line, and to some extent that line. And that's typical. Usually where three filaments intersect is where you get these big halos. We've made all of this data publicly available. And the merger tree data, that's what this is. This is the merger tree of one object. But we have the merger trees for every single object at every redshift. And that's the basis for doing semi-analytic models. It's also the basis for a simple process, which is called abundance matching. We rank order the dark matter halos by their internal velocities. We rank order the galaxies by their stellar mass. And we match them up, keeping the number densities about the same. And then we can compare, statistically, the two universes, the one we observe and the one we create in the computer. Here's an example. The Milky Way has two bright satellite galaxies, the large and small Magellanic clouds, which you can see from the southern hemisphere. How frequently does that occur? Or more generally, how often will a galaxy as massive as the Milky Way have a galaxy 
as its uh, satellite as bright as one of these, or two, or three, or four. Well, in the simulation, we can see everything that would host a galaxy as bright as this. In Stripe 82, the deepest uh, region that's been probed many times now on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, there's about 3,000 analogs of the Milky Way. So we can look at both in the simulation and in the observations. And here's how it looks. The Sloan sky, the Bolshoi simulation. So the results are really quite satisfying. The large error bars are the observations. Uh, with only a few thousand galaxies, we can't probe very well down to the fraction that have three and four and five satellites. But every point agrees with the predictions. There are many other examples like this. This is a, a result that was just published last year. And I'm working with uh, Andrew Heron and Doug Watson uh, to try to understand what's really going on here. So before I talked about all galaxies, but what these guys realized was that old dark matter halos, the ones that formed a long time ago, will host old galaxies, the massive elliptical galaxies, the quenched galaxies. The halos that have formed more recently will host, are plausibly the host, of the galaxies that are still forming stars, the so-called blue galaxies. It's well known that the blue galaxies are less clustered than the red galaxies. This is the correlation function, and higher means more clustered. This is what you get if you simply take the blue galaxies to be in the more recently formed halos and the red galaxies to be in the less recently formed halos. Uh, and the agreement is absolutely spectacular. Not only that, but there's a phenomenon called uh, galaxy conformity, which was really established in a paper last year led by Guinevere Kaufman. If you're on an intermediate mass, stellar mass galaxy that happens to be quenched, it's very likely to be surrounded by other galaxies that are also quenched. This model reproduces that. We haven't completely understood why, but I think I understand what's going on. OK, so that's one way that we can use these big simulations, abundance matching, or this last process is called age matching. And what age matching is telling us is the universe really knows about the details of cold dark matter. Now, this is this uh, scheme that uh, Joe Silk mentioned where we do semi-analytic modeling. It's a very complicated process. And uh, Joe showed uh, Andrew Benson's uh, dozens of parameters that we adjust. And I think the main thing we learned from this is what doesn't work. The problem is that uh, if we get something, some scheme that works, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's how the universe works, because with all those parameters, it's not unique. We understand that. But one of the things that we've done recently is to include the effects of dissipation in gaseous galaxy mergers, properly modeling it, and then also including formation by disk instability, or as my collaborator Abishai Dekel likes to call it, violent disk instability. And it turns out stars mostly form in a disk-like configuration. But today, stars are mostly in spheroid. So there's something that causes the transformation. We used to think that it was mostly major mergers mergers of systems of comparable mass. Now we know they're not nearly enough mergers. We've done careful estimates of the merger rate. And so this other process appears to be extremely important, and in fact, the main way that intermediate mass steroids form. Uh, these are simulations. That's a face-on disk. That's an edge-on disk. You can see it's a disk because it's very flat. This is what the same galaxies would look like if we turn them into what telescopes would see. And as you're about to see, the galaxies really look this clumpy. The average star-forming galaxy at redshift 2 looks like this, full of clumps. These are gigantic clumps. They have masses of 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 solar masses. There's nothing like that in the nearby universe. The big star-forming regions in the Milky Way have masses of, at most, about 10 to the 6 solar masses. So semi-analytic models find the majority of galactic spheroids formed by this violently unstable disks forming these clumps, which then merge onto the galactic center. So there's a lot of things we know about elliptical galaxies and about spiral galaxies. 
elliptical galaxies follow a tight size mass relation. And they have other relations between the speed at which things move around inside them and how massive they are. Same thing with the spiral galaxies. The semi-analytic model correctly predicts all of those things and also gets the numbers right. Now, one of the things we were worried about is that at high redshift, small galaxies are small. If they merge or if they have an instability, they'll make very small galaxies. So that will build in a correlation between age and size. This is the observational data. This is called the face-on fundamental plane. This is the velocity dispersion, and that's the size. And you'll notice that there's hardly any effect in age, represented by this color bar, of size. It's all controlled, pretty much, by velocity dispersion. Well, that's what we found in the simulations. What's happening is that, yes, indeed, at high redshift, we make these very compact objects, just as the observers see them. But then there's enough subsequent minor mergers, small galaxies glomping on, that it makes the galaxies get bigger, and it destroys this relationship that we thought we were going to have to somehow deal with between size and age. There's hardly any size-age connection. It's basically controlled by the velocity dispersion. Same with the metallicities. So age and metallicity depend mainly on velocity dispersion, not on radius, just as in the observations. I now want to turn to actual semi-analytic, sorry, to actual hydrodynamic simulations. So the semi-analytic models, at least our style of doing them, are based on high-resolution simulations. But let's look at the actual simulations. <clears throat> now there's two approaches. One approach is to do a fairly large volume at low resolution. By low resolution, I mean about a kiloparsec. Uh, we're about eight kiloparsecs from the center of the Milky Way. The Milky Way radius is about twice that, so 15 kiloparsecs or something like that, the visible Milky Way. So you might think a parsec is pretty good. Actually, it's lousy. Leaving aside the fact that we cannot, with any of our current computers, simulate the actual region where stars themselves form, which is in a scale less than uh, an astronomical unit, in other words, much smaller than the Earth's orbit, uh, the problem is that the region where stars form, the giant molecular clouds, are tens of parsecs apart. And we have to have resolution of tens of parsecs if we actually want to resolve the region where stars are forming. A kiloparsec is just terrible. So what the people do who try to do these big box simulations, and the two that have been mentioned here are Eagle and Illustrious, and there's also uh, Fabio Governato's Changa project, uh, what they do is they basically do semi-analytic models. They adjust lots of parameters to basically get the star formation to agree with observations, to get the winds coming out of the galaxies. They advertise that they've got terrific hydrodynamic simulation codes, but actually they're disabling. They are disabling the hydrodynamics inside the galaxies. They are, however, getting interesting results for the effects of the galaxies on their environment and the environment on the galaxies. That's been the big success of, of that kind of approach. What I and my colleagues have been doing is much more zooming in. But the price we pay is we can only do, we've done uh, currently over 100 of these high resolution simulations. We've got a bunch more running in the computer. We'll probably do another couple hundred in the next year or so. But uh, so the advantages are we can make very detailed comparison with observations. But you can't do a statistical sample. So at best, you can try to take what you learn from this and then try to model the whole galaxy population, for example, by the semi-analytic method. So I'll show you some examples. So basically, galaxies form where the filaments intersect, typically three filaments. The filaments bring in gas, but they also bring in these lumps, which are little galaxies. It's all going into a little galaxy that's about that big. That's what's going to be our final galaxy. This is an example of one of these simulations where we actually follow and save thousands of time steps of, of the evolution of this little galaxy. You see in white the central stellar spheroid. 
the colors are gas, the gas density is changing as we zoom in, as, as more density forms, we change the color code. And as I say, we've done now well over 100 of these high resolution simulations. Now, we convert the simulations to observations, that is to images that telescopes would see, or for that matter, spectra, by using the sunrise radiative transfer code written by my former student, Patrick Janssen, who's now senior programmer for the SpaceX company. Six of my seven most recent graduate students are now working in industry. But anyway, this is an amazing uh, program that uh, follows millions of rays from all the stars, taking into account the effect of dust, taking into account the effect of all the kinematics, the uh, emission lines, the absorption lines. And it produces spectra like this. This is without dust. This is what a face-on galaxy would look like in green. This is what an edge-on galaxy looks like. And you see all this ultraviolet light was absorbed and that energy has to be re-emitted in the far infrared, mid-infrared and far infrared. So we use this to make images, including the effect of dust. Dust makes the bright regions much dimmer, but it also, whoops, it also uh, tends to make galaxies appear larger, and that's the scattering effect. Now, we've been the beneficiary of the installation on Hubble Space Telescope by the astronauts in May of 2009 of a new camera that for the first time gave us the typical Hubble images, giant images, sharp from edge to edge, but now showing infrared light out to 1.6 microns. We used to be able to see distant galaxies looking like this, because all Hubble had were cameras that basically saw what our eyes can see, plus just a little bit more wavelength. But that now we can see what the old stars look like. Uh, here we're, we're looking at light that had to start out as ultraviolet. And then at redshift 2, it's expanded by a factor of redshift plus 1, so a factor of 3 in wavelength. So all we see with ordinary optical cameras is the ultraviolet emitted by the most massive stars, which don't live very long, so only the young stars. Now we get them both. So the biggest project in the history of Hubble Space Telescope, Candles, has just ended. We now have hundreds of thousands of these images in many wavelengths showing the old stars and the young stars. And so we can now, for the first time, really try to put the whole picture together. So this is the connection between redshift and time since the Big Bang. And as, as I said, redshift 2 is what we're really interested in, that's when the star formation rate peaked. So this is the region that we're exploring, especially with candles. We also get a lot of data from cosmic dawn, the, the very earliest galaxies. Redshift 1 and below, there's lots of data from the Sloan survey and these other surveys, the Dark Energy Survey, and so on. If you don't know, this is a negative image. That other image I showed you is also a negative image. So what's dark here is actually bright. This is what this simulated galaxy looks like without dust. When we include the effects of dust, it looks a lot lower like real galaxies. Similarly here, edge on, face on. Now, one of the features that we've just started to include, our group and also Phil Hopkins' group, I've just started to include in our simulations, is the effect of radiative feedback. So stars produce winds, and they produce, of course, a lot of light, especially these O stars, these very bright, stars that are putting out most of their energy in the ultraviolet and don't live very long, only a few million years. So we're now including that effect. Uh, this is the Rosette Nebula, where no supernovae have yet gone off. But here, and also in the Ryan Nebula, and all the nebulae you've, seen, nebulae you've seen, the Carina Nebula, you always see these regions that have been cleared out by the bright stars. And that turns out to be extremely important for affecting the star formation rate and also what happens when these stars supernovae. So we're now including this effect. And one of the very nice features it has is that before, before we were running exactly the same simulations, but now we're including the effect. And the star formation rates have all come down by about a factor of three. And now they're much more consistent with the observations. I don't have time to explain exactly what's being done here, 
But this is the stellar mass halo mass relation from uh, Beruzzi et al. Uh, and uh, basically what you should conclude is that it's working much better. So what else? Well, as I say, we ran the simulations. We did 35 simulations. And then we did the same simulations, but now including radiative feedback. And this is the same galaxy at the same time step, but you see it's much more elongated. And this merging galaxy hasn't come in yet. We generate images exactly the way Hubble would see them. So we can compare directly with Hubble. Some more examples. Radiative feedback makes galaxies more elongated. And we just published a paper, just came out, that shows that, in fact, the galaxies really are elongated. Why are they elongated? Dark matter halos are elongated because they form on filaments. The material flows in along the filaments, as you saw in that earlier visualization. And so what happens is that there's more velocity this direction, more velocity dispersion, than in that perpendicular direction. And that's what gives you the quote unquote pressure, because it's not really pressure. Since dark matter doesn't interact with itself, it preserves this anisotropic velocity distribution. Anyway, the stars initially form in the region that's elongated because of the shape of the dark matter halos, which are more elongated at small radii. But then, after a while, you get enough baryonic material, ordinary matter, that interacts with itself, unlike the dark matter, and that circularizes. So you start with these elongated structures, and then you get disks. Is this, in fact, what the universe looks like? It is! This is what we just published. Vanderbilt et al. just came out. So they divided, we divided, the galaxies into spheroidal, elongated, and disky. And what you see is that down to redshift one, a majority of the lower mass galaxies are elongated. They're prolate, like this. The higher mass, 10 to the 9.5 to 10 to the 10 solar masses of the stars, down to redshift one and a half, are elongated. This is observation. The simulations are seeing exactly the same thing. I showed you the clumps before. So here's examples of these clumpy galaxies. This is a wonderful new data set from the 3D HST project, which ran in parallel and then is continuing after candles, using GRISM, so low resolution spectra, that give us more information on the nature of these clumps. Now, this was published 2012. And what this shows is that the age is systematically a little bit higher the closer in, the smaller the radius of the clumps. This is what we predicted. This is for what we call ex situ clumps, the ones that are just the external galaxies coming in and merging. This is from the clumps that form by disk instability. They start in the outer disk with young ages, and then they get older. And we're now assembling a big data set from Candles that actually shows just this. And this is uh, from a paper that we just published, uh, led by my former graduate student, Chris Moody, uh, who's now working for Square. And uh, what this shows is what Hubble would see. And this is the gas, and this is a high resolution. And uh, so there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between the clumps that Hubble sees and what uh, we actually predict from the high resolution simulations. Now, another thing that the clumps are doing is clumps and mergers, is driving galaxies to get smaller. When I was first thinking about galaxy formation 20 or so years ago, I never imagined that there was a process that did this. We always thought galaxies form from the inside out and they get bigger and bigger. But there's good circumstantial evidence that galaxies start sort of diffuse and then become much more compact. So this is the compactness parameter. It's sort of like surface density. It's Luminosity divided by radius to the 1.5, and there's a good reason for that that I don't have time to explain. But basically, what we're seeing by looking at the same volume of space at subsequent time steps, starting at redshift 3 with the candles data, is we're seeing galaxies here, and then populating this region, and then populating this region. And in fact, even moving over into here and becoming less compact. So galaxies appear to be getting compact, moving into this region. So this is from a paper that we haven't finished writing yet. But this shows what is happening in our simulations. These are the new simulations with radiative feedback. 
So here are some galaxies that got suddenly much more compact, much higher surface density of luminosity, but the total luminosity hardly changed. They became much smaller. Why? Because the disks were very unstable, and clumps formed, and the clumps are driven into the center by two processes, dynamical friction and viscosity, that are well understood, theoretically. And also, bars form, and they also funnel gas into the center. So we see all these things in the simulations, and the simulations are showing exactly this track. This is the fast track, as we call it, because this process happens in just a few hundred million years. You get these very uh, dense star-forming objects that we call blue nuggets, and then they very quickly quench. Incidentally, half the blue nuggets at redshifts between 2 and 3, half of them have X-ray detected active galactic nuclei. So the same process that's driving material into the center is also fueling the supermassive black holes. There's also the slow track. Those are the disk galaxies that just run out of gas. And we have plenty of those, too. It seems to be controlled by a combination of the shape of the dark matter halo. The early forming halos are the ones that tend to do this. And also the amount of angular momentum. The high angular momentum ones are the ones that form the disk galaxies, the slow track. In our semi-analytic model, we see the same thing. The model was adjusted to fit the low redshift universe. But it's doing a beautiful job of also explaining what we're, going, what we're seeing at high redshift. And that's because we've included in the model the disk instability as well as the major mergers. Well, OK, I've told you about a lot of successes. What about the problems? So one problem is known in the trade as the too big to fail problem. Uh, this is from papers by Michael Boylan Colchin, James Bullock, my former graduate student, now uh, distinguished professor at the University of California, Irvine, and the head of the uh, program in the Southern California campuses of the University of California, the Galaxy Evolution uh, Project, uh, and uh, also managed Coupling Hat. They've written two papers on this. And they said that, that there's a problem that too many of these halos don't host satellites. The satellites that we see don't seem to fit well into the halos. So this is another example. I mean, this is, so I showed you this. This is, of course, this Aquarius simulation. And there's a bunch of dense satellites, satellite halos, that have rotation velocities or, or velocity dispersions that are in the range of 25 to 40 kilometers a second. But these are the things we actually see. So what happened to these guys? These are denser than the ones we actually see. They're so dense that they should be too big to fail to form stars. Okay, That's the too big to fail, of course, taking a, a terminology from the banking crisis. So how do you deal with the too big to fail problem? Well, if the Milky Way were actually less massive than we think it is, then uh, you'd have fewer of these massive halos. But that doesn't seem likely. Besides, Andromeda is definitely pretty massive, and it has the same problem. Uh, so, and, and we're starting to get similar data now on other galaxies. So it doesn't look like either of these first two things can be going on. Saying it's stochastic doesn't answer the question. People are considering warm dark matter, but there's very strong evidence against that. I won't go into it unless people want to ask me or repulsive self-interacting dark matter. If the dark matter gets too close, it repels. It bounces off. And uh, that could solve the problem, but it looks like it's going to cause other problems. Maybe the problem is that these are pure dark matter simulations. They didn't include the effects of baryons. So now, a bunch of people have done simulations, including the baryons. This is from a review that just came out a couple months ago by Ponzin and Governato. And what this shows is, this is the stellar mass. That's 10 to the 7 solar masses. And the idea is that the ones that are above 10 to the 7 solar masses are going to have, so I have to tell you, dark matter halos become quite dense at the center, roughly a 1 over r density profile. The volume, of course, expands as r cubed. So there's no problem that there's any kind of real singularity. But it does mean that the halos are pretty dense. And that's the so-called Navarro-Frank-White fitting formula for the dark matter halos. And for the case where we don't have very many stars, 
that's indeed what the dark matter and the stars should look like. But when you have more than about 10 to the 7 solar masses of stars, the simulations are softening the dark matter. How does that work? There's a bunch of bursts of star formation. What happens is that the ordinary matter comes in. It becomes gravitationally dominant in the center. It comes in slowly by cooling. <clears throat> some stars form. Some supernovae go off. And the material is ejected very rapidly. And everything expands, because you basically turned off most of the gravitational potential. And then the process happens again and again, like so. And the net result, this is the highest resolution simulation yet. This paper hasn't yet been, actually, it's been submitted, but it hasn't been put on the archive. Uh, this is not my group's work. This is Jose Norbe leading a group uh, working with Phil Hopkins, also including the radiative feedback. <clears throat> and James Bullock's a co-author. And uh, Bullock and his student, uh, Shay, uh, Garrison Kimmel had argued that there simply isn't enough energy to, from all the supernovae to move the dark matter out of that very dense central region. But the problem is that that's the wrong way of looking at it. It's not as if first the dark matter halo forms and then the stars have to form and change the situation. The stars are forming all along. So when you actually do high resolution simulations, our group has done them. That's the Trio Gomez, the Iraqi, uh, Tessier, and uh, his group have done them. Uh, and Zolotov, Brooks, that's the Governato group. <clears throat> We're all seeing the, the same thing. <clears throat> so I'm actually nearly done, so we'll have plenty of time for discussion. So the, the big problems that we're dealing with on small scales are known as the cusp core problem, namely this problem that the dark matter halos have very dense centers called cusps, but at least Intermediate mass galaxies don't. They have cores, as we say, of more or less constant density. The too big to fail problem, which is really related to the cusp core problem, and the problem of too many satellites. That is, you saw how many of these substructures there were in the high resolution simulations. The number of satellites that we've discovered so far is about 30. We're going to discover probably hundreds. But we're not going to discover 10 to the fifth, which is the number of the identified substructures in that image that I showed you. So the problem, I think, is not too big to fail. The problem is too small to succeed. The idea is that the simulations had better stop, finding, stop making objects that have either gas or stars or both at the lower internal velocities, the, the smaller mass halos. Those halos had better be too small to succeed to make stars, because we don't see them. And we don't see the gas either. So there's got to be some process that ejects the gas and prevents star formation before it gets going very much at all. And we don't completely understand what that is. So this is amplifying, I think, some of the things that Joe Silk was saying at the end of his talk, that there's a tension. The simulations have to have adequate star formation and feedback to solve the cusp core problem and the too big to fail problem, to reionize the universe. We know that the universe is largely reionized at redshift 9. It's completely reionized <clears throat> at redshift 5.8. This is going to require a lot of star formation, formation of massive stars, and the ionizing radiation has to get out of the galaxies. And we also have to enrich the galaxies and the surrounding media with the heavy elements, the things we call metals, into the circumgalactic medium, but not overproduce early stars and overpressurize disks. So there's a kind of a Caribdis and Scylla problem, and we haven't completely solved it. So what are we going to do? Well, <clears throat> my Santa Cruz colleague, Piero Medow, and I decided a couple of years ago that we need a big collaboration. What we want to do is get everybody or at least everybody who wants to join us, <clears throat> who's doing high-resolution hydrodynamic simulations of galaxies, to simulate the same initial conditions and, as much as possible, the same physics. The only part that they're going to do differently has to do with the fact that we're using 10 different codes, and so they implement the physics differently. And in particular, the subgrid physics inevitably will be done differently. Subgrid physics is star formation and feedback 
and to some extent the feedback from the supernova from the supermassive black holes. So we have a set of initial condition codes that work with all 10 different simulation codes, thanks to Oliver Hahn. We're doing four halo masses, 10 to the 10, 11, 12, and 13 solar masses, two each, one with lots of mergers, one with few mergers. We're using the same code for cooling UV background, the initial mass function of the stars, and the supernova yields. It's not that we know what's right, but by everybody doing the same thing, that isn't going to be the reason that the simulations differ. We are also using a common analysis platform called YT. Matthew Turk and 30 other people have been working very hard on that. I've sponsored four working groups at Santa Cruz, actually three at Santa Cruz, one elsewhere, to make sure that this can read the output from all the simulation codes and generate the same analyses and also uh, make the images using the sunrise code. YT is an input to the sunrise code. Uh, there's currently 110 participants from eight countries, and there's 10 different versions, uh, 10 different codes represented. So initial conditions, astrophysics at all groups will include, UV background, cooling, et cetera, and the tools to compare the simulations, and the images will be available from all of them, and also high resolution spectra, including uh, integral field unit data cubes. We have four working groups that are doing basically the setup material. And we're going to be, we've already published a very detailed paper on the whole project in AppJ Supplement. We have three more papers that we expect to finish this year. And then we have all these groups. And all these groups are led by young people, postdocs, and uh, people who are very eager, uh, junior faculty, to get lots of results out quickly. So I think that this is going to lead to a great improvement. So let me summarize. Large-scale structure does very well. Uh, the, there are simply no disagreements that I'm aware of between the predictions of the large-scale simulations and the observations. Cosmological simulations now provide the basis for abundance matching. I showed you an example of that with the large and small Magellanic clouds. For age matching, and I showed you that taking into account whether the halos formed a long time ago or more recently nicely distinguishes between the galaxies that stop forming stars and the ones that are still forming stars, and semi-analytic models. And I showed you some of the things that we can do with semi-analytic models. Galaxy formation and evolution, distance stability and simulations appear to resemble observations. You saw the clumps. You saw the nugget story. But there are tensions on small scales, and those call for better observations and better simulations. Thank you. presenting that complicated story so clearly. Any questions? Simon over here. Simon Saunders. I mean, this is so um, overwhelming. I wonder what do Mon's supporters say when you present this kind of data? Is there anybody out there who still seriously doubts dark matter? Yes. Uh, there's always a few papers by Modi Milgram and his friends that are still trying to resurrect Mond or something like it. Uh, I think at this point, it's more a question of psychology than astrophysics. Uh, you're not biased by any chance in that. Of course not, no. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm a scientist. I, it's a serious question. If, if we keep making predictions, the predictions keep yeah. being right, right, and the other guys can't make yeah. any predictions at all. Well, well, that's right. It does seem overwhelming. So, uh, I mean, I, OK, good. Uh, John Blackman, it's a point of information. Early in the talk, you said that there are at least 10 to the 8th mass and plus clumps in Z equals 3 galaxies and further, and not in the local universe. Yes. We recently uh, used ALMA to measure uh, the antennae galaxies, and we found molecular gas clumps of 10 to the 8th solar masses. And we've also found uh, H2 regions of 10 to the 8th solar masses, where the stars have already formed. And we've found other interacting galaxies only with the H2 reducing method measured with similar range of masses. So we well, can study these to, to, in order to gain information, uh, detailed information, that you can't get at Z equals 3. Uh, that's wonderful. We, we always love to find nearby analogs of high redshift galaxies. Uh, the, the clumps that I showed you are mostly 10 to the 8.5 to 9 at redshift 2 to 3. But uh, 
it's great if we have similar nearby examples. I was unaware that in the antennae you actually had such things, so I, I want to talk to you some more. Let me also address okay, just briefly. Okay, great. Let's talk. But okay. I also want to address briefly the question that you asked after Joe's talk, which I was surprised that he didn't answer. Namely, you said the old galaxies are the massive ones. Those are the ones that have stellar uh, components that are clearly very old. And it's the small galaxies that are still forming stars. And isn't this a contradiction to the bottom-up picture of cold dark matter? And the basic understanding that we now have about that, I didn't mention it in my talk because it's sort of now become part of what all of us in the business understand. But I think it's not as widely understood as, as it ought to be. So there's a band of masses of dark matter halos in which star formation is efficient. It's around 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 12 solar masses. So what happens is that in a massive cluster, a big massive halo, a big group or a cluster, that halo goes through that star forming efficient region at high redshift, redshift three, two. And then it doesn't form any more stars because there's too much hot gas, the gas gets stripped out, et cetera, et cetera. And and there's all these feedback mechanisms, supernova, uh, supermassive black holes uh, take a big part of this. Whereas the small galaxies are just getting into the efficient star forming region. So, and we actually have a pretty good understanding, which Joe actually explained, of why the 10 to the 11 to 12 is the sweet spot. So that's the explanation. Again, I don't want to give you the idea that we feel that we completely understand any of this. That's why I think we need to do these very careful controlled experiments on the simulations and compare to fundamental theory on the one hand and observations on the other. But I think we have a pretty good idea what's going on. Thanks. Okay, last question. It could be a short question, short answer. So actually, um, comment slash question to responding to Simon Saunders and I would like Joel's opinion. So at some level, C lambda CDM, one of the problems with this theory is that it's very hard to falsify. And some of it That's has because it's right. Well, <laughs> partly. <laughs> It could be because it's right, but it also, I mean, we can't forget the history of how many free parameters there are in all the understanding and how mature the theory is. For any new alternative theory to now emerge and compete is going to be hard. It's going to be very, very hard. So I think we should keep an open mind, although it is pretty spectacular how the predictions uh, match observations. Uh, Briefly. Just a very brief comment that uh, I think it's clear that the universe looks just like lambda CDM on big scales. On small scales, especially the interiors of galaxies or very small galaxies, there's issues. And I tried to be very honest about the issues. And it's possible that those issues are pointing to some new physics. But it's also possible that the new physics is just going to be doing more carefully and with better understanding what we've been trying to do all along, which is understand galaxy formation, which ultimately means understanding star formation. And star formation is the hardest problem in astrophysics. OK, that's a good place to stop. Thanks very much, Joe, for your presentation. Excellent. Thank you.